world, the origins of our person, and the origins of our position. The personal and sovereign God is the beginning of this planet. Amen? He is the beginning of us as a person. He's the beginning of our original situation. You see, we come from a loving God. We are loved as demonstrated by our origins. We talked about origins. We are meant to love as seen in our original context. Thus, our roots are beginning. The outset of us as a person, as a community, as a people, come from love. Love. God is the creator of all that is good, holy, and just. While nature has wilted under the curse of sin, we can still see the excellent majesty of God. As we look into the night sky and peer into the sea of stars, we can rightly say there is a God. Nature testifies about God. Nature does not reject his existence, as some might suggest. I believe that nature upholds that God is real and that God is true. How and why he made us reveals his desire to make his children happy. God has made us six things, moral, God has made us social, God has made us intellectual, God has made us emotive, God has made us physical and spiritual. God gave Adam and Eve commands which tell us that they were a moral being. You can't give a command and not expect them to know what is right or wrong. But they did know. Therefore, they were moral. God made the first couple to live in a relationship with him and one another. This is a social aspect of our being. God gave them intellect. The first couple were intelligent beings. God made them emotive. I mean, remember when we saw that Adam, when Adam saw Eve, the brother broke out in poetry. <laughs> bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, woman. And motive. God created them to be physical. They were to eat all the fruits of Eden except for one tree. Also, they were to be fruitful and multiply. Intimacy for a husband and wife. Finally, God made them spiritual, and this is seen in God's gift of the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath humanity. So the totality of the human experience is bound up in our understanding and acceptance of our relationship with God and with each other. And this relationship is grounded in love. We were created to be loved and to love. And because this is true, I believe that the focus of creation the reason why God set everything up the way he set up is because he wanted to give the best for Adam and Eve. The focus of creation was humanity. God made creation to, uh, as a paradise to bless the first couple. I mean, Moses, when he wrote uh, about the sixth day, he wrote a lot of words about the sixth day. Every day is important and nice, but the sixth day just seemed to attract and draw Moses' thoughts as he was inspired to write about that day. This highlights the importance of the design of humanity. Moreover, God created the male and female in his image. What a blessing, what an honor, what a privilege. God made us in his image. Finally, God gave the first couple dominion and stewardship over creation. Humanity possessed all the rights and benefits of a king and queen over a vast kingdom. God is such a, a generous, liberal giver to humanity. Sadly, something occurred that changed this beautiful beginning. What happened? Well, Genesis 1 and 2 reports that God created the perfect environment for his children. But then Genesis 3 introduces us to the fall of humanity. The fall of humanity. We've walked this ground several times from this pulpit, so I want to highlight uh, some parts of the narrative in Genesis chapter 3. The story introduces a crafty and subtle serpent. The Bible identifies the serpent in the garden with Satan, Revelation 12, 9, Revelation 20, verse 2. And this serpent challenged God at the beginning of the cosmic conflict. Let me tell you, church, we are in something bigger than what this nation is facing. Don't get me wrong, the nation is going through problems, but there is a bigger narrative overriding, overarching everything that we're seeing happen, happening right now. And so at the beginning of the conflict, this serpent, this adversary, this, this enemy, the, the Lucifer, Satan, however we want to call him, he challenged God. And we can see this in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. He poses questions and statements that seem to quote God, but introduce subtle deceptions to Eve. Eve began to parlay with the serpent, and this resulted in the serpent deceiving her. 
When she saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree desired to make one wise, the mother of the human race took the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, and he ate it, knowing full well the consequences of his actions. In the end, the first couple fell to the enemy's lies. Paul summarizes the fall by saying that death entered our world through one man's disobedience. Death entered into this world. The enemy is now the God, and I use that in quotation marks, small g, of this world. By falling into temptation, Adam and Eve forfeited their dominion and rule to the adversary. And, it all, and it's all lost. It seems like it's all lost. There's, there's no way out of this. But God was there to provide the only way out of their predicament. It might have seemed ho- hopeless for Adam and Eve's situation. In all honesty, they could not do anything about it to change it. They were destined to die. Yet my favorite author wrote these words. As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. We should be praising God, amen? As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. Christ knew that he would have to suffer continuing, yet he became man's substitute. As soon as Adam sinned, the Son of God presented himself as surety for the human race with just as much power to avert the doom pronounced upon the guilty as when he died upon the cross of Calvary. This surety, this down payment, this, this, this guarantee is given in the first proclamation of Genesis 3.15. Let's go there real quickly. Let's go to Genesis 3.15. We want to just read the text. Read the text. <clears throat> Genesis 3.15, and if you're there, church, say amen. We're getting there, amen. Genesis 3.15, I know we're there. Let's read. Follow along as I read. I'm reading from the ESV. I will put enmity, real quickly, who will put enmity, church? God. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Real quickly, who is he talking to here? The, 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 The devil, the serpent, right? He's talking to him. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is, this is the first gospel promise. Um, in, in, some, in some theological talk, they call this the proto-evangelium. This is the first gospel promise. And God announces a conflict. He, he says a conflict between the woman and the serpent. From the verse, if we read carefully, it talks about between you and the woman, her, between her offspring and your offspring. And then it seems as almost the verse heightens the battle and says that when the woman's seed bruises the head of the serpent and the serpent bruises the seed's heel. This is almost like the height of the battle in the text. The serpent and the seed have the same action. One bruises the other, right? There's bruising. Same Hebrew word, suf. This is, so the, 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 the verb or the action isn't necessarily the emphasis of the text. The difference is the location of the bruise. Are you catching on to me, church? It's not, they, they both do the same action to each other. It's the same word, same Hebrew word. But it's not, that's not the emphasis, the action. It's the location of where they bruise one another. The serpent bruises the seed's heel. This bruising is discomforting, but not fatal. The, ser- the seed endures a moment of pain. However, he lives. Amen. And because he lives, <laughs> I can what, church? Face tomorrow. Conversely, the seed bruises the serpent's heel. And the placement of the blow from the seed to the snake's head is a crushing blow. The implication is that the seed would defeat the serpent in the long run. And we should be praising God for that. While the serpent bruises the heel, the seed bruises the head. And the victor in this struggle is the seed. The seed. And just think about it. While he is saying these words, the trembling human couple heard the creator's pronouncements upon the serpent. They're in the earshot. They're there. I mean, they've gathered because God has come to them in the midst of their fall. God has come to them and said, I will be there in the cool of the day. He has come to meet them because he knows that they have fallen. And it's not something they try to hide. And God asks the question, 
Adam, where are you? And let me tell you, it's not so much that God didn't know where they were logistically in the, in, in the garden. He knew exactly where they were at. The question was to them, Adam, do you know where you are now in your relationship with me? Do you understand what sin has, how sin has impacted both of you to me? That there's a change now in the relationship, and God didn't mean for this change to happen. And so there he were, and so he, he, he is there, he pronounces something to the serpent, but in the earshot of Adam and Eve, they hear this. It was in this that gave them hope. True, they're about to face expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Also true, they lost their innocence and purity. Even more true and more accurate, they will lose their face-to-face relationship with their father. What a loss. All is lost. But God will not leave them in their desperate situation without promising redemption. Amen? So the creator is also their redeemer. The one who creates is the one who redeems. The focus of creation, the human couple, is now the focus of salvation and redemption. Adam and Eve heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. What a promise is found in the seed. In the seed. But we must remember that the context of the promised seed is one of conflict and struggle with the serpent. There is a fight. There is a battle. The, 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 the serpent will brood the heel of the seed. The seed will crush. So there is a conflict. There is a fight. So from the outset of the fall of humanity and the promised seed, there is a pattern in the Torah. There is a pattern in the Pentateuch. It is one of promise. God gives the promise. And then there is a threat to the promise. Because the devil would fight, he would argue, he would battle, he would make a conflict out of it. But in the end, God's reassurance of his promise, God will always reassure his promise. And so we see this immediately. So after leaving Eden with a heavy heart, Adam and Eve had their first child, had their first child. And the matriarch of our planet named her baby, first child church, Cain. In her words, she said, and, and this is in Genesis 4.1, we're there, Genesis 4 and 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. I don't agree with the translation in there. The Hebrew, I think, is a little more tighter than that. What she's really saying is, I've gotten a man, the Lord. Amen? All right. I've gotten the man, the Lord. Now, now. Uh, a majority translation, they add the preposition from to the text, or as this one did with the help. Um, I've gotten a man from the Lord, um, but I would argue that the text was better translated as a man, the Lord. You see, Adam and Eve are living with the expectation of the promise deliverer. Their first child to them is the fulfillment of the promise. So Genesis 4.1 I mean, in their understanding is that we've gotten a child, God has promised the seed, and so here's the child, the promise is here. They're, they're excited. And so Eve, out of, her, out of her love and joy and thanking God, she says, I've gotten a man of the Lord. And so, in fact, you read the text carefully, this threefold pattern suggests that translation. A uh, man, the Lord. First of all, uh, we have someone performing an action to someone. So here, look at verse 1. Adam knew Eve. Same, 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 same uh, construct. And then she conceived and bore Cain. And then I have gotten a man, the Lord. Same, so same format when you read the Hebrew. Same context. It doesn't make sense if we were saying Adam knew from Eve. You get my point? And she, she conceived and bare from Cain. No, that doesn't sound right. I have gotten a man from the Lord. So that right there, the three-fold pattern, I believe, is suggesting that she says, I have gotten a man, the Lord. She said that here, the Lord has come. He is here. But let me ask you the question. How did that work out for them? Huh? What happened with this son named Cain? He murdered his brother Abel. In the background of Cain and Abel's story is Adam and Eve's hope in the seed whom they believe is Cain. But Cain reveals that he is not the deliverer. Instead, his actions are more of a threat to the promise. If the story was to end here, if we had no other Bible after that text, um, no, we, would not, we would be lost. 
the promise will not be realized. However, God blessed Adam and Eve again with their third son, Seth. And Seth will continue the line of the seed. You see, God reassures the first couple that his promise will continue in Seth. And this is found in Genesis 5, the line of the seed from Adam to Noah. Adam to Noah. So we see the promise, we see a threat to the promise, but then God reassures them with the promise by giving them Seth. But the devil doesn't rest, he doesn't sleep. He's a roaring lion, right? He's out. And so what happens after Genesis 5? The wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every attention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Here, another threat to God's promised seed rears its ugly head. The serpent has led humanity, most of humanity, to reject God's love. And if we were to stop once again reading the text at this juncture of scripture, we would have no hope. Thankfully, a person named Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6, 18 tells us that God established a covenant with Noah. And then he confirms the covenant with them after the flood in Genesis 9. In fact, in Genesis 6, 18, the language suggests that God is, if we read, if we read the, Hebrew, uh, the, the Hebrew, it seems to be saying reestablishing the covenant with Noah. Reestablishing. This could be an interesting study one day, but you know, we'll get to that another time. Amen. But the point is that the threat to the promise came about again through the degradation of humanity. All of, all of the human world, except for a few, seemed to just go against God completely. However, God provided the answer to the danger of his promise. The providential act is God. He covenants with Noah and God never backs out of a covenant or a promise. Amen? Amen. So here we're seeing this pattern. So there's the seed is very prominent in the Torah. The seed is very important in the Pentateuch. And the idea is that the devil says, I want to crush the seed. I want to hurt the seed. But he can never extinguish the promise of the seed. Amen. After the flood, after Genesis 9, what is the next threat to God's promise? I'm just trying to paint the picture of this scene. We don't have to, we don't have to turn too far in Genesis. We come to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. You see the, you see the picture, church? Yeah. The devil's out. He's trying, to extinguish, he's trying to extinguish the seed. Moses wrote that the whole earth had one language. As people moved, some came together in the land of Shinar. It was there that they decided to build a tower. Unfortunately, the people rejected God's sign of the rainbow, which promised he would not destroy the world again through a worldwide flood. And this is such an interesting point here in the text when we read Genesis 11 in, in, in context of what God has promised. Man, fallen man, desires to be self-sufficient and independent from God. That is th that quirk in human nature, fallen nature, that we think we can do it, that we, we got it, God. You can, hold on, God, we'll take care of business. No, we can't take care of business. We need the seed. We need God. And so here they are thinking that, you know what, we know you promised us, God, that you will not destroy the world. But you know what, we are going to build anyways. We're going we're, we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna do what we want to do. We're going to, you know, do, this is what we want to do. This is what we believe. And so they want to build and build and build. And fallen man desires to be self-sufficient and independent from God. We cannot do anything apart from God. And this attitude really echoes the first apostate, Lucifer. If we were left to ourselves without the work of God's grace in our lives, we would be headed to an early grave with no hope of redemption. No hope. Thankfully, God is faithful to his plan of salvation. God comes down to the land of Shinar. And it's so interesting when you read the passage, when you read the text. You know, I, I want to just go to just to read it because I, 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 I love the, the point here. Let's go to Genesis 11. Go to Genesis 11. <clears throat> and when we read verse, uh, verse 6, reading verse 6, follow along, chickens, as, as, I, as I read. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. They have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. 
come, let's, what's the word, church? Let what? Let what? Let us go down. Let us. So this is God speaking. This is the Lord. Let us go down and there, and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8. So who? The Lord. You get the, you get the implication? He says, let us go down. And then the one that goes down is who? The Lord. There's a plurality there. Amen? Trinity. I just want to point that out. You see, God, all of God is interested in planet Earth. Jesus, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they're all in. So they're saying to each other, let us go down, and then the ones that go down is the Lord. <laughs> Plural, singular, interesting. But, but why? You know, we see here, we look in here, we see that the, uh, the, they've all come together to go against what God has promised. And so God says, no, no, we need to, we need to make sure that we point out clearly we, that humanity cannot do anything apart from God. And thankfully, God is faithful to his plan of salvation. God comes down to the land of Shinar, confounds the tongues of the builders, thereby ending the threat to the promise. However, we must ask, where is God's reassurance of his promise in here? Well, the, the, the line of Shem after the tower brings us to Terah. Terah, when we read the text carefully. So Shem is carrying the seed, the line of the seed, and it brings us to Terah. And Terah introduces us to which character in the Bible, church? Abram. Terah is Abram's father. And so Abram comes out. Abram. Now it says Terah, and then, and then it introduces Abram. Abram then comes forth as the one who will be used by God. And that's where we go to Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Here, Terah is the father of Abram. Abraham, Abram comes to the forefront with God, and he enters into a covenant with God. And this promise is given in Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Let's read Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Amen, church? If you're there, I think we're there. Follow along as I read. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Please notice that God promises to Abraham that he, the sovereign God, will make Abraham a great nation. Also, he will make Abram's name great. Finally, through Abram, God will bless all the families of the earth. God will use Abram in three different ways. He says, you're a nation, uh, his name, and a blessing uh, to others. And now Moses, he, 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 he wrote this here, and then he unpacks the meaning of this further on in Genesis 15. 15 speaks about God making Abram into a great nation. And then we go further on to Genesis 17. It tells us how God will make Abram's name great. He talks about how out of their line, out of him and Sarah, he changed their name there, Abraham, Sarai, to Sarah. And he, gives, and he tells them that out of you will become kings. So he will make his name great. And then in Genesis 22, informs us how God will make Abram a blessing to others. Let's go to the Genesis 22. Genesis 22. We, 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 we have to catch this. This is such an interesting point here. Genesis 22. Now, what's happening in Genesis 22, church? The sacrifice of Isaac. In the Hebrew text, they call it the Akedah. Because it's such a very moving, important story for, 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 for the Hebrew people. Such a very important, key story here. We, we know the story. Um, God calls Abraham and says, take your son, your only son. You know, the, the son that is of the promise. Take him because you know, this is the son that Abraham and, I, and Sarah had together. This is their biological son. <laughs> and this is the promised son. And take him, take your only son, and go, and go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Man, I, I, I'm not sure how I would feel about if God gave me a call like that. I'll be honest. I mean, just thinking out of, out of my circumstances, my situation, I'm like, wait, if I had only one son that was the promised son, that out of him, 
you know, blessings and so forth would happen around the world, and now you want me to go and sacrifice him? First of all, God doesn't accept human sacrifice, amen? I mean, God is against that. When, when, when he warned his people about idolatry, he said that if you go into idolatry, it's going to lead you to an ugly place where you will begin to sacrifice babies. And that was an ugly. And so God says, no, no, no. But here he is asking for a sacrifice of his son. And then Abraham says, okay, you know, I'll go. And he says, early in the morning, pack things up. Didn't tell mom. Because, of course, mom would object. <laughs> you know, obviously, moms are like, no. <laughs> no. And rightfully so. And so he goes. And then they go through this process. And as they're walking up the hill, I can just imagine as they're walking up, you know, this mountain. And if, I wish I was uh, like a little mouse there that, that's running around, scurrying around in the forest. And to hear their conversation, what were they saying to each other? How, how were they speaking to each other? Isaac, of course, does say, <clears throat> Father, we have, the, we have the fire, we have the wood, but where's the sacrifice? Where's, Isaac knew that we needed a, a lamb or a goat. We needed some kind of animal here to perform this, to, to fulfill this. Of course, Abraham says, God will provide. And real quickly, I want to point out that, that those words are, 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 are foreshadowing uh, Daniel. <laughs> you read it carefully, it's foreshadowing Daniel. But here, God will provide. You know, and so there they come to the spot, and then that old man began to bound up, bind up his son Isaac. I mean, Isaac, according to the text, seems like a very strong, you know, a young lad. You know, he's not some weakling. You know, he could have easily said, oh, hold on, old man. You're not taking me down like this. But he submitted to his father. And then as Abraham had the knife raised up, and as he was ready to strike down, it's all interesting when you read it in the Hebrew. It's almost as if the emphasis is right there when the knife is up. That's the emphasis of the text. And he's about to come down. And then God says, stop. Now, Abraham, I know who you are. <laughs> and God, in the thicket, has a ram. And he says, there, there's your sacrifice. But here, here, you know, uh, 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 we see the promise. Uh, verse 15. Follow along as we read verse 15. We're talking about the seed here. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, by myself. God swears on himself. God, he is the foundation of oath. Declares the Lord because you have done this. Interesting. The angel of the Lord, I have sworn upon myself, declares the Lord. Interesting point there. But um, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. So here, your offspring will be plenteous. There will be a multitude. There will be as the stars of the heaven, as the sand on the seashore. And there, there's going to be a lot. The offspring is going to be a lot. And then it continues, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. Real quickly, church, his. Just English grammar, his. Is this referring to a group of people or to a single person? His. Single, right? His. Single. One person. Singular. Right? And here, when we read it carefully, when we read the text carefully, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So his is referring to who, church? Who is his related? Who is his talking about? Who is his? Thy seed, thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. His enemies, his is thy seed. So we'll say, okay, well, well big deal. We kind of walk through some grammatical structure on it. What's the big deal about it? Because in the beginning part, the offspring is talking about a multitude of people. But then it all of a sudden it changes to one. The seed, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Now, real quickly, let me ask you the, another question. When we're thinking through scripture, when we're talking about the gates of the enemy, what scripture pops into mind, church? The gates of hell. The only gates that we can't handle. But Jesus says that the gates of hell cannot stand against him. The seed that will conquer the gates of his 
enemy. So the seed, see, there's this battle once again. The promised seed, the threat to the seed, but the seed is the victor because of he will possess yarash. He will subdue. He will control. He will conquer is what the Hebrew is saying. The seed conquers, and we're so blessed because of what the seed does. This is the crucial point for the Torah after the fall. God has opened the plan of salvation for sinful humanity. And the center of that plan is the seed, the offspring, Jesus Christ. You go through the New Testament, they refer over and over again to the seed. Paul says the seed is is Jesus. The seed is the Messiah. The seed is Christ and no one else. And because the seed is conquered, we can receive redemption. Our creator and redeemer acted with grace and love for us through the promised seed. The Torah provides narratives and pictures about God's action concerning the first couple's fall into sin. While the Creator warned Adam and Eve about eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they disobeyed their father by accepting the serpent's lies. And the result was that the fallen angel replaced the first, the first couple as the ruler of this world. Also, the adversary assumed the rulership of Adam and Eve. So God spoke to the situation with the promise of the seed. As soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. Amen. God was leading his wayward children to the promise of Christ. The focus should always be on the seed, who he is, what he is, why he is. At the same time, the devil would engage in battle with the seed. It was his purpose to snuff out the promise. The Torah reminds us of the enemy's opportunity, Cain, the antediluvian world, the Tower of Babel, over and over again, are examples of his attempts. And the devil knew that Jesus would come down and give his life as an atonement for sin. And thus, he, the devil, would try and intercept the seed so he can make the seed sin. Or if possible, destroy the coming deliverer. He tried. He tested. He tried. Jesus said that the prince of this world came to him, but he has no claim on Christ. Amen. Praise, the good, praise God, the devil failed. Christ was victorious. The eternal purposes of God find their fulfillment through the definitive, demonstrative, deliverance, deliberate, decisive, and dangerous act of the seed. Jesus could have failed, but he did not. The sinless Christ might have left us to our ruin, but he did not. The eternal son who condescended to reach man could have been swept up in the possibility of never being, with, being one with the Father again. But he did not. Beloved, Jesus, the seed, the exact image of God, the Alpha and Omega, the Word of God, the last Adam, the bright and morning star, loved us so much that he gave all for our redemption. This is the promise. And we live in that promise. Is it your desire to live in that promise, church? Is it your desire to say, Lord, I want the seed in my life and no, no other place. I want you a part of me. Is that your desire, church? Is it our desire this morning to say, Lord, I want to give all to you. And I want to learn how to trust you in all that has happened. Is that our desire, church? If it is, raise your right hand. Raise my right hand. Because I, I want to trust in Christ. I want to trust in him. And as we stand and sing our closing hymn this morning, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Isn't it sweet, church? There is no other place of, 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 of safety or protection or guidance. Only in Christ you can find that.
Persuasion the Spirit brings in. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him all and all. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. Just to trust his cleansing 